Yes. Let's continue with our review. We're going to talk about another form of number next. We're going to talk about everybody's favorite type of number. Fractions. Yeah, I know. I, I can hear the sarcasm there. Um, I realized that if I asked people on the way in the door what they hated most about math, four out of five people would probably say fractions. So the, the top number of a fraction to review is called what? Numerator, there you go. The numerator. And the bottom number is the denominator. Perfect. Well, what does it mean to numerate? Well, every 10 years, our government sends out people to do the census to numerate the population. What are they doing? They're counting. That is a count. We have three of something here. Denominator, well, we have different denominations of money, different denominations of, of religious organizations. To denominate means to classify or give a name. People look at fractions like three over seven, three sevenths, and they see two numbers. But really it is one number with two parts. Just like having three inches, three cows, three whatever, this is three sevenths. We have three of something, and what it is is a seventh. So the first thing we need to do is define what it is to have a seventh. Um, we're going to go with a little bit simpler version to do that definition. We're talking, what is it to be a three-fourths? So here we have three-fourths. What does a fourth mean? <coughs> well, I'm going to go back to the old elementary school illustration. Pretend that looks like a circle. My artistic abilities are also severely challenged too, by the way. Pretend that looks like a circle. And we're going to go back to that, that old illustration of a pie or a pizza or whatever you want to think of it as. That fourth means that that whole thing is cut into four equal pieces. Pretend those look equal as well. So every whole object is cut into four equal pieces. Or the other way to look at it is it takes four of these pieces to make one whole object. The three means that we have three of those pieces. Not the greatest at coloring either, as you can see. So that's three-fourths. <clears throat> now when we go to add fractions, add and subtract fractions, let's do like three-sevenths plus two-sevenths. If you go back to third or fourth grade when you first learned to work with fractions, that third grade teacher told us to add or subtract fractions, you must have common denominator there it is that's not anything new to fractions when we add or subtract any numbers you must have the same name we had three inches plus six inches we had to have the same name to add those numbers same applies with fractions nothing new also to add them you're going to combine the numerators two plus three is five and Keep the common denominator. Keep it as sevenths. Again, that's not a special rule for fractions. We had our three inches plus six inches. We had to have the same name. We combined the counts. Three and six make nine. And we kept the same name. The same with any other number. So there's no special rules for fractions. You know, we looked at feet and pounds. We couldn't add those because they had different names. However, with fractions, if I have three-fourths plus one-fifth, those have different names and we can't add them the way they appear. Fortunately, we're going to be able to change their names so that we can add them. So one of the first things we need to be able to do with this picture is figure out how to change the name. But one of the simplest things we can do to that, if we think of it as a pizza again, is cut each slice into three equal slices. Pretend these are equal as well. Since you're pretending, you just don't keep rolling, right? Well, you had to pretend I'm handsome and funny too. Just go for the hat trick, right? So anyway, 
How many pieces does it take now to make a complete object there, to make a whole object? 12 if we count them up. We had four. Each of them got cut into three pieces. We now have 12. Four times three is 12. How many pieces do we have in the yellow there? Careful. Nine. Good. We had three. Each of them got cut into three pieces. Three times three is nine. What we have there now is nine twelfths. Well, do we have any more or less pizza than we did before? No. Exactly. Nine twelfths and three fourths are exactly the same amount. How is it that we were able to, to change the appearance without changing the actual amount? Well, we multiplied by three on both top and bottom. Technically, what we multiplied by was three over three, which is saying... We have three pieces. It takes three pieces to make a whole object. In other words, that is one. Exactly. That's what we call a unity fraction. It has a value of one. We can multiply any fraction by the same thing on top and bottom. Multiply by a unity fraction. And it won't change its value. It'll just change the appearance. So if I have two-fifths, I can multiply the top and bottom by the same number, and it won't change its value. Somebody pick a number between 1 and 10. What's that? Uh, 7. 7. Perfect. So we can multiply top and bottom by 7. 2 times 7 is 14. 5 times 7 is 35. 14 35ths is equivalent to 2 fifths. Now, in practice, we're not just going to pick random numbers to multiply by. There's going to be some sort of reasoning behind it. So let's say I have two-thirds. Most of the time, I'm going to have a name or denominator that I want to change it to. Maybe I want to change this to twelfths. So the first thing I have to figure out is, what do I multiply three by to turn it into twelve? Four. Perfect. Four times three is twelve. So what do I have to do to the two? Multiply by four as well. Two times four is eight. There we go. So 8 twelfths is equivalent to 2 thirds. If I have 3 fifths, what's that going to be as 20 fifths? 15 20 fifths. Perfect. Yes. You Perfect. You multiply by 5 to get 25, you multiply 5 on top to get 15. So 15 20 fifths is exactly right. <coughs> we can go the other direction. If I have that 15 20 fifths and I want to turn it back into 3 fifths, well, all I have to do is divide both numbers by 5. 15 divided by 5 is 3. 25 divided by 5 is 5. Turns it back into 3 fifths. So I can change the name of a fraction. It's called reducing when I do this to make the number smaller by dividing both the numerator and denominator by the same number. If I have 18 over 42. Now a lot of times you've been told you must find the largest number that divides into both of them. That's not true. It's easier if you find the largest number, but we're still going to get there. Now looking at these, a lot of you have probably already figured out what that largest number is. But I'm going to go a little bit different route. Both 18 and 42 are even. So you can very quickly see that both of them can be divided by 2. 18 divided by 2 is 9. 42 divided by 2? 21. Now that, now that I've already divided out the 2, I can see that they can both still be divided by what? 3. three good. 9 divided by 3? Three. 3. 21 divided by 3? Seven. 7. Perfect. That's as far as I can go. Now a lot of you probably saw that we could have divided both 18 and 42 by what right away? 6. six. Good. 18 divided by 6 is 3, 42 divided by 6 is 7. 
if you see that largest number right away, it is a lot less work. It gets us there in one step. But if you don't, you don't have to do it all in one step. You can go step by step and still get to the same answer. A lot of times, once you divide out that first number and you get to smaller numbers, it's easier to see what else they can be divided by. <coughs> what if I have something like 44 sevenths? Well, remember that 7 is telling us it takes 7 pieces to make a whole object. We have 44 pieces. We have more than enough to make a whole object. In fact, we can make several. How do we figure out how many pieces we can make? Or how many whole objects we can make? Perfect. 44 divided by 7, if we punch that in the calculator, it's going to give us 6.28571428 approximately. What's that tell us? You can get six whole pieces and some left over. Perfect. We get six whole pieces and there are some pieces left over. How do we figure out how many pieces are left over? Well, there's a couple of ways we go about it. A lot of textbooks will say, okay, you got six whole pieces. Six times seven is 42. We've used up 42, so how many are left? Yeah, 44 minus, for, perfect. 44 minus 42 is two. So there's six and two sevens left over. What's basically going on there is a division and remainder. Here I divided it out and I got a decimal. But if I had divided it out using long divisions, and instead of going to a decimal, just use the remainder, 7 does not go into 4. So 7 goes into 44 6 times. 6 times 7? 42. 42. We subtract to get 2. So there's 2 left over. So those 2 are still 7s. So it is 6 and 2 7s. So the division gives us the whole number, and the remainder is what stays in the numerator of the fraction. So if we have 21 eighths, it's going to work the same way. 21 divided by 8. Well, 8 goes into 21 how many times? 2. 2 times 8? 16 with how much left over? Five. Yeah, 21 minus 16 is 5. So that's 2 and 5 eighths. This is what we call an improper fraction. Now improper implies there's something wrong with it. There isn't anything wrong with it. In, we call it improper just because we don't like having the numerator bigger than the denominator. This is what we call a mixed number. Because it mixes whole numbers, the whole objects, and fractions. We usually reduce improper fractions into mixed numbers because it's easier for our mind to visualize. 21 eighths is actually tough to visualize. The average human brain can visualize between 7 and 13 things at one time clearly. If we try to visualize more than that, yet some of the pieces start to fade, fade out. 2 and 5 eighths now is grouping a bunch of those pieces together so you don't have so many things to visualize. It's easier for your mind to comprehend. <clears throat> Sometimes, however, we want to go the other direction. We might have mixed numbers and want to go back to improper fractions. If we have 3 and 1 fourth, to go back to an improper fraction, we have to break these three whole objects back into pieces. How many pieces are in each of those whole objects? Four. The denominator tells us that each whole object has four pieces. So we take those three objects, break them each into four pieces, gives us how many pieces? Twelve. And we had one already. So one plus twelve is thirteen. So that is thirteen fourths. So 5 and 3 eighths is the same thing. The short, short way of doing it, it's 5 times 8 is 40. Add 40 to our 3 is 43, and it's still eighths.
seven and three fourths is going to become how many fourths? 31. 31, good. Seven times four is 28. Three plus 28 is 31. Any questions? Okay, so now that we can rename our fractions, let's go back to working with them. We had that example there of three-fourths plus one-fifth. We need to give them the same name. I always do my addition vertically like this. It's just the way my mind thinks. You can, If you want to do it horizontally, that's fine. The first thing we need to figure out before we rename them is what name we're going to change them to. There's a couple of ways to go about that. Now with 4 and 5, a lot of you probably already see it. But let's go through some of the methods of, of figuring out if you don't see it. We can start counting up by 4s or 5s or whatever. It's called multiples. The multiples of 5 are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. Most of us are pretty good with those. So a number like 5, I wouldn't even bother writing them down. I'm going to recognize one when I see it. 4, well, we're going to have 4 plus 4 is 8. Another 4 is 12, 16, 20. There's my first one in common. So I could change both of those to 20s. I get asked every semester, can't I just do 4 times 5? Yeah, you can. That'll give you a common denominator. Not always the smallest one, but it will be a common denominator. Do we have to have the smallest one? We've been told we should, but no, we don't have to. And I'll show you what happens later on. I'll show you what happens if we don't find the, the smallest one. What happens if we use a different one? So anyway, that would be 20. <coughs> um, there are some other methods with factoring and stuff like that. I will post some of those out there in review videos for you. Um, when I post the recordings for the week, I'll put some of that out there for you as well so you can see some of the factoring methods for finding common denominators or common multiples as well. For right now, though, we know that we need to change these to 20. What do I have to do to the 4 to turn it into a 20? Times 5. Good. What do I have to do to the 3? Times 5. Whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. So this is going to become 15 20ths. Good. What do I have to do to the 5 to turn it into a 20? Times 4. So what do I do to the 1? Four. Times 4. So 1 times 4 is 4. Now I have the same name, 20ths. So I can combine the counts. 15 and 4 make 19. And keep the same name, 20ths. Perfect, 19 20ths. I'm not going to do any more simple fractions. We're going to move on now to doing mixed numbers. So what if I have 5 and 1 third plus 2 and an 8? Well, again, I'm going to write them out vertically because that's how I think. We still need to find the same name. Now, you'll notice when I wrote these out, I put the fractions here just at the end of the number, almost like they're the last digit of the number. Because, in fact, that's all a fraction is, is just the last digit of a number. So the 5 and the 2, the whole numbers are not going to change. It's the fractions that we're going to rename. Between a 3 and an 8, what's my common denominator going to be? 24 is what I have to change them to. What do I have to do to the 3 to turn it into a 24? Eight. Times 8. So 1 times 8 makes 8 24s. What's going to go here? I'm going to skip a couple steps. This one's going to be 3. Good. 8 times 3, so 1 times 3 makes 3 24s. Now, just like adding any other number, I'm going to start at the end. I'm going to start at the right side and work my way back to the left. Adding the fractions first. 8 plus 3 is 11 24ths. 5 plus 2 is 7. Now it doesn't stay that easy. We're going to run into ones like this. 
six and three fourths plus four and five sixths. So I'm gonna write them down here. Again, writing them vertically. Now a lot of people don't rewrite the whole number when they change the names. I do because if I just change the fractions, I sometimes forget to do the whole numbers. What's my common denominator gonna be here? 12 works. If you uh, didn't see the 12 and just multiplied them together, you would end up with 24. I'm gonna come back in a minute and show you that works just fine. What's gonna go here? Nine, good. Four times three makes 12, three times three makes nine. What goes here? 10, good. Six times two makes 12, five times two makes 10. Now again, I'm gonna start adding on the right, working my way back to the left. Nine plus 10 is 19 twelfths. What's wrong with that? It's an improper fraction. So it's gonna be one and 7 twelfths. Now, just like with any other number, I'm going to keep part of it there, and I'm going to carry part of it to the next column. So I'm going to keep the 7 twelfths, and I'm going to carry the 1. So 1 and 6 is 7 plus 4 is 11. So it's 11 and 7 twelfths. So I'd said, what if, what's that? Carry. Well, I had one and seven twelfths here. I can't keep both of them there. So I'm going to keep the seven twelfths and the, the one goes into the next column. Just like if we had um, 57 plus 26. Seven and six is 13. I can't keep 13 there. So I keep the three and I carry the one to the next place. Same process. So what if we'd use 24 instead of 12? Well, now it would be 4 times 6, so 3 times 6 is 18. 6 times 4, so 5 times 4 is 20. 18 and 20 makes 38, 24. Well, you see here that both of those can be divided by 2, right? So it's 19, 12. So you get back to where you started, just have an extra step. That is 1 and 7 twelfths. And we're back to exactly what we did before. So if you use a, a denominator other than that smallest one, all that changes is you're going to do a little bit of work reducing it at some point along the line. If you didn't divide by 2 here, you're going to end up with 1 and 14 24, so you're going to reduce the 14 24 at some point. So you'll still end up at 11 and 7 12, so the right answer. Let's do some subtraction. We're not going to do any simple fractions. We're going to jump right into the mixed numbers. We're going to do 8 and 3 fourths minus 2 and 2 fifths. What is our common denominator going to be? <coughs> 4 and 5 is going to be 20. Good. What's this going to become? 15 and this one? 8. Good. So now we're going to subtract starting at the back of the number, the right, and working our way back to the left. 15 minus 8? 7. And just like addition, when we subtract, we keep the same name, so 20 is. 8 minus 2? 6. So 6 and 7, 20 is. Now, once again, it does not stay that simple. So if we go to subtract here, we need a common denominator. What's it going to be? 24, good. What's this going to become? 8, and this one? 
15, good. Now we go to subtract. 8 minus 15 doesn't work. So what do we have to do? Now just like with whole numbers, we've got to borrow from the next digit. So this 7 becomes a 6. Now, what's wrong with what I just did here? I just put a 1 in front of the 8. What's wrong with that? Perfect. What I borrowed was one whole object. This denominator of 24 tells me that that whole object contains 24 pieces. So I have 8 plus 24. I now have 32 24 If you think about it, if I just put a 1 in front of the 8, that's 18 24 It's not bigger than 1 yet. Well, I borrowed 1. It has to be bigger than 1. So when I'm borrowing with fractions, the one whole piece, the one whole thing that I'm borrowing contains the number of pieces in my denominator, so I have to add the denominator to that numerator. We'll do another example of this coming up so you can help clear that up. So we've got 32 now minus 15 is 17, keeping the same name at 24. 6 minus 4 is 2. So 2 and 17 24. Let's do another one of those. So 9 and 1 6 minus 5 and 2 thirds. I'm actually doing a couple of things to you here. What's my common denominator going to be? 6. Yes, yeah, sometimes the common denominator is one of the denominators. What's this going to be? One. It stays 1. What's this going to become? 4. four. Three, perfect. 3 times 2 is 6. 2 times 2 is 4. We go to subtract. 1 minus 4 can't be done. So this becomes what? 8. And what do we have to add here? We add the 6. We add the denominator. We do get 7, 6. So now we subtract. 7 minus 4? 3, 6. 8 minus 5 is 3. 3 and 3, 6. Are we done? No. What do I still have to do? Yeah, 3, 6 becomes three and a half. perfect, 1 half, 3 and 1 half. This happens quite a bit when we subtract. Even though we use the least common denominator, we can subtract and still have something that we have to reduce later. <coughs> Let's look at multiplication. Two-thirds times one-fourth. When we multiply, do we need the same name? No. no. So for fractions, that means we do not have to have a common denominator. We do not need the same name. We can multiply anything. And when we multiplied, we combined the counts, then we also combined the names. So we're just going to do 2 times 1 is 2. Then combine the names. 3 times 4? 12. 12. Now what do we notice there? We can reduce to 1 sixth. Perfect. Both of those can be divided by 2. Reduces to 1 sixth. Now some of you might be looking at this original problem and asking, why didn't he cross cancel? Others at this point might be asking, what's cross canceling? Well, we look at this. The top one is going to just become 2 times 1. The bottom is going to be 3 times 4. If we look at that, we see that the 2 and the 4 both can be divided by 2. It can be reduced by 2. So it can reduce that before we multiply. If I had done that up here, 2 divided by 2 is 1. 4 divided by 2 is 2. I get 1 times 1 is 1. 3 times 2 is 6. I get my reduced answer right away without having to reduce later. I reduced before I multiplied. Now, in a problem like this one, it's about the same amount of work either way. But we can run into problems like this. Where it's a lot easier if we reduce first, if we cross-cancel first. Now, some of you called it cross-multiplying. 
Um, I use cross cancel because there's other processes that we're going to call cross multiplying. But it's the same thing. Cross canceling, if we don't cross cancel here, you've got 24 times 35, which is 840, and 25 times 36, which is 900. And I'm guessing everybody looks at that and sees both of them can be divided by 60, right? Note a little bit of sarcasm there. 14 15. So you probably would have divided by 10 and then 2 and eventually got down, you'd get down to 14 15 eventually. But I don't care to work with really large numbers, especially if I'm doing things manually like I am right now. But if I had taken my 24 25 times 35 36 and I look at that closely, I see. First of all, I see that 25 and 35 can both be divided by what? 5. 25 divided by 5 is 5. 35 divided by 5 is 7. 24 and 36 can both be divided by? Okay, 6 or 12. Now the 12 will work nice, but let's do the 6. 24 divided by 6 is 4. 36 divided by 6 is? Six. If you do that, you'll see that both the 6 and 4 can still be divided by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So again, you don't just like reducing the fractions before, you don't have to find that biggest number right away. You can go in steps. Now, 2 times 7 is 14. 5 times 3 is 15. We get to the same answer. To me, this is a lot easier than this. Now, once again, we're not going to spend a lot of time multiplying simple fractions. We are going to jump up to mixed numbers. So 5 and 1 third times 7 and 1 fourth. If we were to go to any university and find 10 math majors, and ask them how to multiply mixed numbers, I would be surprised if even one out of the ten could show you how to do it correctly. Multiplying mixed numbers is an extremely difficult process. So, we don't do it. How do we avoid multiplying mixed numbers? Exactly. We make them into improper fractions. Five and one-third becomes how many thirds? 16, good. 5 times 3 is 15, plus 1 is 16. 7 and 1 fourth becomes how many fourths? 29, good. 7 times 4 is 28, plus 1 is 29. Now that we've got them in improper fractions, we can multiply them just like any other fraction. In fact, we can cross cancel just like any other fraction. What can we cross cancel here? 16 and 4 can both be divided by 4. 16 divided by 4 is? 4. 4 divided by 4? 1. Perfect. So 4 times 29 is? 116. 3 times 1 is? 3. Now we do still have to go through a little bit of work to change that back into a mixed number. So 3 doesn't go into 1, but 3 goes into 11 three times. 3 times 3 is 9. 11 minus 9, 2, bring down the 6. 3 goes into 26, 8, 8 times 3, 24. 26 minus 24 is 2, so that's 38 and 2 thirds. Anybody curious to see how you'd actually multiply the mixed numbers? Sure. Sure. sure? Good. I was hoping somebody would say that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Then the two is what's left over. Okay. So what's left over goes back on the fraction. <laughs> so now, when we multiply whole numbers, if I have 
like 27 times 36. This 6 multiplies the 7, but it also has to multiply the 2, right? Same thing happens with our mixed numbers here. We have 5 and 1 third times 7 and 1 fourth. This 1 fourth has to multiply the 1 third, but it also has to multiply the 5. So 1 fourth times 1 third is 1 twelfth. 1 fourth times 5. Well, how do we multiply a fraction by a whole number? We get 5 over 1. So now that's 5 over 4, or 1 and 1 fourth. Now we move over to the 7. 7 times 1 third. What's 7 over 1 times 1 over 3, which is 7 over 3, or 2 and one third. Yeah, I, I don't expect you to remember this process. This, this is extra. So then we got the seven times five, which is 35. Well, right now we have these four items that we have to combine. We need to find a common denominator, which would be 12. So that's one twelfth. This is gonna be one and one fourth becomes three twelfths. 2 and 1 third will become 4 twelfths and a 35. 1 and 3 is 4 plus 4 is 8 twelfths. 1 and 2 is 3 plus 5 is 8. 38 and 8 twelfths, which is 38 and 2 thirds. Which is the same answer we got up here. Um, this process here is really ugly. I will stick with converting them to improper fractions and multiplying them that way. Like I said, 10 out of 10 math majors would probably not be able to show you how to multiply mixed numbers like that. So if you did not understand what I just showed you, don't worry about it. You will never have to see it again. So let's go back to just multiplying two mixed numbers, doing it the easy way. Tell me what to do. <coughs> First step, improv. Go ahead. Good. Four times two is eight plus three is 11. So that's 11 fourths. Over here. Forty-one eighths. Very good. Five times eight is forty. Plus one is forty-one. Now at this point, we would cross cancel if we could. Is there anything that cross cancels here? No. no. So we're going to multiply straight across. Eleven times forty-one is four hundred and fifty-one. Four times eight is thirty-two. And now the the only tough part is. Division and remainder to turn it back into a mixed number. Does 32 go into 4? Nope. nope. How about 45? Once. Once. So that's 32. What's left here? 3 and 1. 13. Now what? Bring down the 1. 32 goes into 130. Four times. Four times two is eight. Four times three is twelve. That's one twenty-eight. We subtract here. Eleven minus eight is three left over. So we bring that three up into our fraction. That is fourteen and three thirty seconds. What do you think? Better to sharp stick in the eye? Yep. Good. <laughs> Let's look at dividing fractions. When we multiplied fractions, we multiplied straight across. We said that multiplication and division are the same operations. One's going forward and one's in reverse. Does that mean I can divide fractions straight across? Can I do 12 divided by 3 is 4? 25 divided by 5 is 5? Does that work? Is that the right answer? Actually, it is the right answer. Would that work every time? No. Actually, it would. <laughs> so why don't we do it that way? 
<laughs> so the reason we don't do it that way is we run into things like this. Three-fourths divided by two-thirds. If we try to divide straight across, three divided by two is like 1.5, and four divided by three is 1.33333. It doesn't divide out evenly. What were we taught to do? <coughs> Some of us were taught to do a zigzag method of cross multiplying. You do three times like that. The other method we were taught, that's kind of a gimmick. It's a shortcut of the other, the other way. Which is you change your multiplication or your division into multiplication by a there's the word reciprocal. Multiply by reciprocal. The reciprocal is just taking this second fraction, the one we're dividing by, and flipping it over. Two over three becomes three over two. And now we multiply. 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 2 is 8, 9 eighths or 1 and 1 eighth. Believe it or not, this process here came from what I just did up here. I'm going to show you how. Once upon a time, if I did 3 fourths divided by 2 thirds, they notice that this doesn't divide out evenly in each of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this fraction I'm dividing by. I'm going to multiply the new. Now, don't write this down. You're not ever going to have to do this. I'm just showing you kind of a historical way of doing it. I'm going to multiply the numerator times the denominator. 2 times 3 is 6. I am going to rename this first fraction by multiplying by 6 on top and bottom. So 3 times 6 is 18. 4 times 6 is 24. Now if I divide, 18 24 is the same as 3 fourths. So if I divide by 2 thirds, 18 divided by 2 is 9. 24 divided by 3 is 8. 9 eighths or 1 and 1 eighth. So I get that same answer. Now, still you might be wondering, how did this become multiplying by a reciprocal? It's not as far of a step as you might think. At some point, somebody looked at this, 3 fourths times 6 over 6 divided by 2 over 3, 2 thirds. They looked at it and they realized, if I do this division first, 6 divided by 2 is 3, 6 divided by 3 is 2. What I get there is always this fraction flipped over. So they just renamed that the reciprocal, and we're left with multiplication. So multiplying by a reciprocal is nothing more than skipping a whole bunch of steps in this process and just multiply. Does that make sense? Now, we're still going to just take the reciprocal and multiply. We're not going to go through all that extra stuff. But sometimes it's kind of helpful to see where those processes come from. Now, we're not going to stick with any more simple fractions. We're going to jump right up to mixed numbers. So let's say we have 5 and 1 half divided by 1 and 3 fifths. Now, since we're going to turn this into multiplication, it makes sense that we're going to do the same thing we did with multiplication. We're going to turn both of these Mix numbers into improper fractions. Perfect. So how many halves will this be? 5 times 2 is 10 plus 1 is 11. How many fifths will this be? 8. 1 times 5 is 5 plus 3 is 8 fifths. Is this multiplication now? No, it is still division. Can I cross cancel the 2 and 8? Say no. No, it's division. I can only cross cancel in multiplication. Now the first fraction never changes. That stays 11 over 2. It's the one I'm dividing by. It's the second fraction that works with the division. So the reciprocal of 8 fifths is 5 eighths. Now it is multiplication. Now I could cross cancel if anything did. Unfortunately right now nothing cross cancels. 
11 times 5 is 55. 2 times 8 is 16. 55 sixteenths. 4 if I divide that out. 16 goes into 55 three times. That's 48 with 7 left over. So 3 and 7 sixteenths. Okay, I am a few minutes late for our second break. Apologize for that. So let's go ahead and take our second break at 724. Let's come back at 734.